Research on Organisation and Management. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that very uh, nice welcome. And uh, good evening, everybody. It's an enormous privilege and pleasure to be with you uh, this evening and to be able to address you. And it's really wonderful to see so many colleagues and friends and, and family. So uh, it's the organisation, stupid. Organization, healthcare organisations are, are in the spotlight right now more than ever particularly with the publication last month of Robert Francis's report into the events at Mid Staffordshire and issues of how healthcare organization how healthcare is managed and organized managed and organized is at the top of the agenda it's not a new concern when Florence Nightingale campaigned for uniform statistics for hospitals two centuries ago or one and a half centuries ago um, so that we could compare wards with wards and hospitals with hospitals, the assumption lying behind her campaign was that organisation and management matters. So most of us in this audience will be familiar with the challenges facing healthcare in industrialised countries in the next uh, few years and currently. We are living longer Developments in technology means healthcare systems can do a lot more than they used to be able to. There are increasing public expectations, both about the quantity of healthcare and the quality, and concerns about that quality and accountability. And of course, increasing healthcare expenditures, this graph shows the average for OECD countries and for four industrialised nations. So there are a myriad of ways that healthcare systems around the world have tried to address and are trying to address these challenges, and these are just some of them. So moving care out of hospital into the community, changing organisational structures through, for example, mergers of hospitals, reorganisation or reconfiguration, as it's known, of clinical services, using informa information technologies to improve healthcare, involving patients and users of services, and partnerships between research and healthcare. And over the last uh, 20 years or so, I've been involved in research um, in all these areas. Um, but for this evening, I'm just going to be um, touching on those ones that are highlighted in yellow. And many of them are based on fallacies, which it's important to uncover through research. And some of them have negative un uh, unintended consequences, which is also important to highlight. I started off my career as an embedded researcher in the NHS and during that time conducted research on issues such as appropriate, the most appropriate use of acute hospital beds, of psychiatric beds and evaluating interventions that were trying to um, reduce reliance on hospitals by moving care out into the community such as hospital at home and all these issues are still um, pertinent today. In 1994, I moved to the London School of Hygiene, as Andrew mentioned, and I'd like to tell you about two studies that I was involved with, uh, with there. The first concerns the mergers of healthcare providers, and these are based on a number of assumptions, for example, about improvements in clinical services that can be gained from such mergers and economic gains. And the evidence on both of these is uh, very mixed, um, but mergers uh, still go ahead. And we studied the process and, and impact of mergers through, first of all, a retrospective cross-sectional study of all nine mergers that had taken place in London in one year. And then we did in-depth case studies of four of those over a two-year period in the second and third year following merger. And we also looked at the impact of mergers on management costs. And in terms of our analysis of the merger process over time, what you can see here is... Um, uh, the different stages. So this is the time pre-merger, the consultation period, and then the first uh, two years post-merger, and then three years. And we identified a number of negative unintended consequences of these mergers. For example, the blue line here shows delays to service development, which started post-merger and continued into the third year. We also identified a loss of managerial control, which increased during the consultation period and then rapidly into the first and second year, levelling out then. 
We, all, we also identified the emotional cost of mergers, the effect on staff. And this started when the consultation document was published and again continued in, in the first and second years of the merger. There were some positive aspects of merging healthcare organisations, um, which I have to say were mostly uh, takeovers rather than mergers. There were identified opportunities for learning and sharing of good practice over the course of the merger. And we analysed um, these processes as uh, dynamics between structure and agency, drawing on Tony Giddens' structuration theory. So the point here is that, for example, perceived differences in organisational culture between the organisations actually affected uh, the merger process. So um, as this executive board member told us, there might be four miles difference between us, but there is two decades in terms of um, culture and practice. And so we concluded that mergers are based on simplistic notions of organisational change that do not take into account the dynamic relationship between the organisation and its context and between the organisations and the individuals within it. And Dilbert sums up this um, very succinctly and uh, better than we could. Um, so that the moment you start talking about a merger, it can have a, a negative uh, impact on, um, on staff. And mergers are still on the agenda today, albeit in a different uh, context, as this um, uh, item from the Health Service Journal last month shows. But the implications we drew from our study and the conclusions are still relevant today. So first of all, we say, consider the alternatives. Mergers have these significant unintended consequences, so think about doing um, something else before you go down that path. So can you, for example, um, can some of the objectives be achieved through less than full merger? For example, where only parts of the organisations need to integrate. Can you consider some alternative strategies, for example, developing alliances and partnerships or joint ventures? And if you must go down the merger route, then think about how to avoid those unintended consequences. Mergers require more management support, not less. So there's an idea that when you merge organisations, you can take management costs out, which we found, in fact, wasn't the case. So they require more support to reduce delays in service developments, to support staff through change, and to address differences in organisational culture. So the second study I'd like to uh, talk to you about this evening um, that I conducted during my time at London School of Hygiene is on the use of information technologies. And this was in the context of the National Programme for IT, uh, which is pretty well known and probably most of you know about it. So it's a, it was the largest civilian IT programme in the world and the largest outsourced IT project from the public sector. And contracts worth 6.2 billion were procured during 2003-04. And we studied the implementation of the National Programme from the perspective of uh, local acute trusts. So we did four uh, case studies of um, hospitals over two years, uh, looking at what happened uh, as they tried to implement the national programme. And we also studied two particular, two specific IT interventions, um, computerised physician order entry, uh, which is essentially electronic requesting of tests and browsing of those results, and um, something called picture archiving and communication systems, PACS, which is essentially uh, electronic um, uh, imaging uh, and browsal of, the, of those images. And we conducted a control before and after study of those uh, interventions to look at efficiency issues and a qualitative study of the implementation. Our findings uh, aren't quite so excoriating as this uh, front page of, the, of, of Private Eye from 2007. Uh, however, we were quite uh, critical However, the, this front page does make an important point in terms of understanding the context of how the programme was implemented. It highlights the role of uh, Tony Blair, who, as they pointed out, uh, can barely, could barely use a computer himself. I don't know whether he can now. Um, but he was the driving force uh, behind the national programme. And there's a well-known meeting that took place in 10 Downing Street between Tony Blair and senior civil servants from the Department of Health. And Tony Blair said, I want this national programme to be implemented within six months. So that's, uh, um, well, yes, OK, the laughter shows that you can tell that he didn't know anything about how you might try and do that. And the senior civil servants paled 
um, but they weren't on very strong negotiating ground. So they said, well, how about 12 months in terms of implementation? And as you can imagine, that's still rather um, ambitious. And they settled on nine months, <laughs> which had enormous implications uh, for how the program played out at local level. So what they did manage to do was procure the contracts within those nine months. However, to do that, they did not uh, engage the end user, meaning they didn't involve the clinicians and frontline staff in the NHS in the design of those uh, systems. And while they managed to procure um, the contracts very quickly, there was then a huge delay in implementation, um, which meant that trusts were uh, left with ageing patient administration systems, which are key to the operation of hospitals, and adopted a sort of patch and mend uh, process. And concerns with, were raised with us about the impact on, on patient safety. And criticisms that we made um, and, and many others made about the balance between setting national standards and having uh, local implementation uh, meant that subsequently the national programme has been uh, localised. In terms of the implementation of specific IT interventions, um, we looked at these uh, partly in terms of uh, Roger's well-known theory of the diffusion of innovations, and we found it partly helpful to explain what was adopted. So, for example, he likes the attributes of the innovation being important. And we found that's true with PACS, which has been uh, widely adopted uh, throughout the NHS and is now routinely used. And the characteristics of adopters are also very important. But what he, um, he, he didn't um, discuss, because he takes a very individual approach to adoption of innovation, are wider sociocultural influences on Im implementation, which are very important and often underplayed. And they were underplayed then, and they're still underplayed now, um, when we hear uh, constantly about the promise of IT to improve healthcare. <coughs> Andrew mentioned, um, while I was at the London School of Hygiene, I was also involved in establishing and running a national uh, programme which was funding research on the organisation of delivery of healthcare called the SDO programme, which is now part of the National Institute for Health Research. And there are two highlights uh, from that. The first is um, how we went about setting the priorities for that programme, which um, in its time was, was quite innovative. And what we did was we conducted a range of focus groups around the country of patients and service users, clinicians, all staff connected with the NHS to understand what the important issues were for them. And we used that to uh, build the priorities of the programme. And in fact, our sister organisation in Canada um, uh, copied our approach and then we jointly um, wrote it up. And another highlight was from the beginning, um, we brought together a, wide, uh, a group of academics from a very wide range of disciplines and approaches um, to think about um, how these um, disciplines could address the many questions around the organisation and delivery of health services. So we brought together psychologists, sociologists, epidemiologists, statisticians, economists, um, can't name them all, um, and um, put them together uh, in this book to make the argument that you need multidisciplinary um, a focus on these, kinds of, uh, on these kinds of questions. So the social scientists amongst you um, will know about um, the observational methods that we use in this kind of research. Um, so we use ob uh, ob observation to observe um, behaviours, actions and decisions. For example, observing meetings um, in clinics, what's happening on a ward. And we distinguish between non-participant observation and participant observation. Until then, uh, I'd only engaged in non-participant observation. Um, but at this uh, point, I decided uh, to uh, tackle a bit of uh, participant observation, and I uh, married um, a, 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 an NHS chief executive. <laughs> Good, you laughed in the right place. That's fantastic. Um, in 2005, um, I moved to King's College London, um, as Andrew said, to take up a chair in health policy. And um, during my time there, um, was uh, scientific director of, of this centre, which he's already mentioned, which uh, the focus was on patient safety and quality. And the centre was a partnership between the university and the local NHS, the idea being to link research and practice much more closely and use research to improve healthcare. <laughs> 
And I'm just going to share uh, one of the studies we undertook uh, within the centre, which, in, uh, which focused on attempts, attempting to improving medication safety. And this is a really important issue in the NHS. It's estimated 1% to 2% of hospital inpatients experience harm due to medication error. And it costs the NHS £500 million a year in additional bed days alone. So we got together with some pharmacists and we developed this uh, scorecard here to use on wards in two hospitals. And the scorecard looked at various medication safety issues, such as whether patients with allergies were identified, whether um, drugs were properly um, identified, um, whether they were properly administered, and various uh, prescribing issues as well. And we conducted a control before and after study of the feedback to staff and a qualitative study to understand the implementation issues. And tonight, I'm just going to share with you the baseline data from six wards in two hospitals over a three-month period. And that uh, covered between 482 and 634 patients. So we found that over 10% of, of patients did not have their allergy status fully documented on their drug chart. Over 40% of patients experienced at least one drug omission in the 24 hours prior to data collection. 10 to 20% of patients either had ID bands that did not match their allergy status or no ID band at all. And between 25 and 50% of patients had an unlabeled drug in their patient-owned drug locker or a drug labeled for a previous patient. And these um, data, for those of you who haven't seen this kind of data before, might be quite shocking. But actually, um, they're similar to findings from other studies in other contexts. What happened then when we um, shared these findings? Well, in terms of the findings that on average 40% of patients had one drug omission in the previous 24 hours, the director of patient safety at one of the trusts said, it's probably paracetamol. So we went back and had a look, and out of the total of 568 drug omissions, we found 47, 8.3% were paracetamol. We shared findings with the Medication Safety Committee where the results weren't viewed as unusual or surprising and to a group of senior managers um, who had no, no reaction. And this is an example of where this level of error has become normalised. And other researchers in the field have found uh, similar with other kinds of um, errors. And it's perhaps an example of what Francis has highlighted in his report of where we tolerate the intolerable in terms of standards of care. And it's really important to understand the, these cultural contexts of quality and safety if we're going to improve them. And we're now exploring some of these issues um, on a much broader canvas. And Andrew mentioned this study, the Quasar study, which is funded by the EU Seventh Pr Framework Programme over three years at €3 million. Euros. And it's a study looking at the organisational and cultural aspects of quality and safety. And in addition to England, we've got four other partners in the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal and Sweden. And we're also involving stakeholders from 11 other European countries to uh, help us develop our outputs. So this study takes us as focus that quality improvement is a human and social endeavour, not just a technical one. It's a multi-level comparative study focusing on interactions between the macro policy level, the meso organisational level and the micro clinical service levels and their effect on policy. And it's translational research, translating research into outputs which we hope will have relevance, utility and value. And the study builds on a previous study by Paul Bate and Glenn Robert, the latter who's in the room, um, who undertook a study of um, high-performing hospitals in this country, the Netherlands and the US. And they identified six particular challenges that all these hospitals were addressing to different extents and in different ways. And we've added to these six two more, leadership and managing the external context. And we're using this framework um, to look at how quality improvement is carried out at the macro level, at the national level, in these five countries. So what funding mechanisms are used, what the regulatory frameworks are for quality improvement. And then at the organisational and service level, how quality improvement is enacted. So we're studying two hospitals in each of the five countries, one high-performing and one less well-performing. 
and have undertook a whole range of interviews and observations. And that's some of the team. Using um, all these data, we're now at the stage where we're developing research-based guides for senior leaders of hospitals and payers to develop their quality improvement strategies. And I'm just giving you a sneak preview here of our prototype, which we're currently um, developing. And these guides will be available later this year, and we're hoping then to implement them uh, with uh, boards of hospitals. So the final um, area I'd like to share with you this evening is on um, the reconfiguration or reorganisation of clinical um, services. And the first study uh, we did looked at three cases um, of reconfiguration around the country with quite different outcomes. In the first case, the plans for reconfiguration were fully implemented. In the second, they were partially implemented. And then in the third one, they weren't implemented at all. And what we found both at national and local level is that changes to hospital services are viewed by policymakers and managers as a rational technical process. If only we can share the evidence that there is to reconfigure services, we'll get the public and healthcare staff uh, behind us. What we found in these cases was that the implementation processes were influenced by the nature of the changes proposed, so the public reaction was much more um, vociferous if you were talking about closing accident emergency or maternity services, and local politics was very important, uh, much more than the, the strength of the evidence. So building on that study, and now um, with, together with experts in research on stroke care, we're looking at uh, reconfiguration of stroke services. And the case for change uh, for reconfiguration was made in the National Stroke Strategy in 2007. Stroke is the third biggest cause of death in the UK. Outcomes for stroke in the UK compare badly with those uh, internationally. And services aren't organised to enable best clinical practices to be provided. We have good evidence about um, what clinical care should be provided and when. Um, however, they weren't organised in that way. So, for example, regarding acute stroke as an emergency, to provide immediate access to diagnostic scans and to cl clot-busting treatment for patients whose stroke was caused by a cl clot, and physiotherapy assessment within 72 hours. So London and Greater Manchester have led the way with changing their services to try and um, provide the best quality care. And just to explain, the model in London before the changes, stroke services were provided by 32 hospitals. And if you um, had a stroke in London, you'd be taken to your local hospital. And there was a great deal of variation in the quality of care that was provided by those hospitals and whether you received best evidence care or not. So as a result of the reconfiguration, services have been concentrated into eight hyperacute stroke units, or HAZUs. And now, if um, someone has a stroke in London, they are taken uh, directly to one of these hyperacute stroke units uh, where they receive uh, the best um, acute uh, care according to the evidence. And those were arranged geographically in London uh, so that the maximum journey time is 30 minutes because it's very important that people receive the care within that time. And the other important thing to note is this reconfiguration resulted in five hospitals losing their stroke services, which, as you can Im imagine, caused, uh, uh, resulted in some uh, degree of resistance. So in Manchester, what happened was there were people that wanted to implement a similar model, which was the subsequently implemented in London. Um, however, um, they ended up implementing a less radical model. And the key difference is that for patients who show symptoms of stroke before, uh, within four hours, they are taken to the equi equivalent of a HAZU. Um, but uh, for patients uh, who come into contact with services after four hours, um, they go to their local uh, district hospital, which is pretty similar to the model prior to reconfiguration. And the four-hour point is that for patients uh, requiring uh, clot-busting drugs, they need to receive those within four hours but they are, in fact, a minority of stroke patients. So our valuation has two prongs. First of all, 
what works? Does the reconfiguration work in terms of clinical outcomes and at what cost? And secondly, understanding the development, implementation and sustainability of the changes. And through this study, we hope to provide lessons for stroke services in the rest of England and elsewhere and for reconfigurations of other services, such as major trauma, vascular and cardiac services. So I'm able to share some early findings with you from this study, which are hot off the press. And the next uh, two slides are courtesy of my colleagues, Steve Morris and Rachel Hunter. So what we're showing in this slide is the proportion of uh, deaths in 30 days. And uh, the green uh, line represents London, the pink is the rest of England, and the, the blue is Manchester. And you'll see, um, because we've um, noted where the reconfigurations had completed for Manchester and London, prior to the reconfigurations, there was a decline in mortality rates across the country. For our study, what we've looked at is uh, the difference in, 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 in death rates after the reconfiguration. And you'll see for London, uh, the gradient is actually uh, steeper and the difference with the rest of England is larger. So in other words, it seems to be pointing to the reconfiguration has uh, resulted in um, an increase in the reduction uh, in mortality rates. And in fact, we estimate that 235 lives are saved directly as a result of the reconfiguration per annum. For Manchester, uh, they were originally above the rest of England and came uh, into line with that, but haven't uh, reduced further. And I should say that um, these are unadjusted figures. Uh, when we uh, controlled for various variables, um, the results are the same and are statistically significant uh, for London. In terms of the impact on length of stay, which is an important factor when we uh, later come to look at uh, cost effectiveness, there's a similar uh, pattern before the reconfiguration, so there's a decline in length of stay. However, for both London and Manchester, uh, length of stay is reduced um, even further following the uh, reconfigurations. So I alluded to the fact that London and Manchester um, introduced different models, and the one in London was more uh, radical than that originally uh, uh, implemented in Greater Manchester. And, and why was that? Well, findings from our qualitative study point to one of the important factors was how resistance uh, was managed. That's uh, resistance um, particularly from clinicians who were going to uh, lose their services. And in Greater Manchester, they took a consensus approach. So uh, they were very keen to keep everybody on board. Unanimity was the most important thing. And therefore, the, the uh, model they implemented uh, was less radical and kept everyone on board. In London, the approach they took uh, was characterised by one of our interviewees as holding the line. Stroke was their clinician's life, and they wanted to get the best for stroke. But actually, what got it through was being straight with them, trying to explain it to them, but in the end, holding the line. So this research is now extended to cover plan changes to stroke services in the east of England and the Midlands. And our study now covers 50% of the population of England. And we're also going to be studying further changes to Manchester as they're now going to be implementing the London model. And it's a great opportunity for us to study changes in real time, um, which is the first time I'm in my career I've been funded to study changes before they happen rather than afterwards. And it's pretty, uh, pretty unusual and very exciting. It's also an opportunity to study attempts to improve the quality of services across a really wide geographical patch at a time of huge structural change in the NHS. As David Nicholson told the Health Select Committee earlier this month, we're about to abolish 160 organisations and we're about to establish 211 new ones. So the question, uh, two of the questions for our study are, will improvements seen in London and Greater Manchester be sustained through this change? And will the public see improvements to stroke services in East of England and the Midlands. And I've been uh, using this slide since 1996 uh, when uh, Steve Bell uh, first published it uh, in The Guardian. And uh, we'll see uh, whether, um, and I've actually been using it nearly every year subsequently, and we'll see uh, whether it it's, uh, uh, foretells what's going to happen in the next, uh, in the next few years.
So finally, I'd like to share some reflections on doing this kind of research. And the first is, we need to keep making the case for doing it. Research on, um, in, in biomedical research and assessment of health technologies is really important, but it only takes us so far. In terms of the outcome of those health technologies, we, the way healthcare is financed, delivered and organised is going to have an impact on those. It's reflected in a, in a development of funding streams in a number of countries, but we need to keep making the case. There are a number of methodological issues raised by doing this kind of research, and these are just some. So as I've um, pointed out previously, we often need multidisciplinary teams to address these complex um, pro pro questions and processes. The use of theory is really important to help explain why and how an intervention works or not, not just whether it works. And as Merton proposed, to integrate theory and empirical research uh, through the development of middle-range theory. So to use theories about why and how innovations are adopted on organisational learning, on change management, to understand what the empirical data are telling us. And to study changes over time, not least because developments in healthcare technology and policy happens at breakneck speed. And finally, to think about the balance and consider carefully the balance between local bespoke research and generalizability. And this is where the role of understanding and detailing context is really important. There have been a number of initiatives in the last few years to develop partnerships, much closer working between universities and NHS organizations to fast track research into practice and thereby improve patient care. And these are really welcome. But we also need to consider and take account of the political and institutional context within which these partnerships take place. Universities and NHS organisations have different drivers. Universities privileged, privileged traditional academic outputs and NHS organisations are focused on service delivery and meeting targets. And although, although there are changes in that direction, with the universities now being measured on the impact of their research and NHS organisations being prompted to be more involved in research, still these differences are really important and important to, to make clear when developing these partnerships. And the sensitivities of doing this research is often unacknowledged. And the example I use here is those of never events. <coughs> And never events is an idea that originally came from the US. And these are errors in healthcare, which shouldn't happen if you have uh, preventive strategies in place and include things like wrong site surgery. And the original notion was meant to be to help healthcare organisations learn from error and improve. But unfortunately, both here and in the US, they're used to penalise organisations and NHS organisations don't uh, receive funding if they, um, if they report never events and may even be fined. So undertaking patient safety research in that kind of environment uh, can be very sensitive. And this relates to my final point about the politics of doing this kind of research. And as Andrew also mentioned, uh, I've been involved with a foresight partnership over the last few years in providing national guidance to NHS boards on their governance arrange arrangements. And after the first NHS Healthy Boards document was published, we were asked to um, develop a separate tool for the emerging clinical commissioning uh, groups on their governance arrangements. And the then Secretary of State for Health um, was very anti-boards and uh, very anti-independent representation on those boards. And we reviewed the literature and evidence in this area uh, both in healthcare and outside in the corporate world and the voluntary sector and so on. And all the evidence and guidance pointed to uh, that it's necessary to have boards and uh, particularly to have independent uh, representation on those boards. And uh, we fed that back in our review. And um, the question that came back down the line to me from a civil servant was, does the evidence have to be so clear? Well, sometimes it does, and uh, sometimes um, doing this research, we have to speak truth to power. So over the last few weeks when I've been um, uh, putting this uh, together, uh, I've been puzzling about how to include a picture of this man uh, in my talk. Um, 
mostly because he's one of my great heroes and also because we were fortunate enough to see him win his second gold medal at the Olympics last summer. And then 10 days ago, the current Secretary of State made uh, this speech in which he said, imagine for a moment that the main objective for our Olympic athletes was not to win, but to not come last. And he went on to suggest that too much of the NHS is focused on doing just that, um, the equivalent of not coming last. So let's see um, if uh, the, public uh, the public in this country um, agree with him about that. And this is taken from the Ipsos Mori poll last November, uh, which asked, which two or three of the following would you say makes you most proud to be British? And in joint sixth place uh, came the Houses of Parliament and British <laughs> Business. In fifth place, the BBC. In fourth place, the Royal Family. And in bronze medal position, Team GB, which is quite interesting, only three months after the Olympics. In silver medal position, the Armed Forces. Yep, you've guessed it, the gold medal went to the NHS. So that's an interesting finding and perhaps a message for policymakers and politicians of all types not to forget the affection within which the NHS is held. So it's a wonderful thing to work in the field that I work with and with the people I work with, and um, many of whom are in the audience tonight, and I've tried to remember them all, and I may not have remembered everybody, and you might uh, see your name there. And um, it's a fantastic thing to work with fellow academics um, and people running health systems, both in this country and throughout the world. And I've learned a huge amount and hope to continue working uh, with everyone. As you'll appreciate, if I'm going to give Martin time, I won't be able to name ev any, uh, everyone here. Um, but there are two people I would like to name, uh, who Andrew's also already uh, mentioned, um, who are my, my parents. And uh, not just for the usual reason uh, of being my parents, and without them I wouldn't be here, obviously, um, but also because um, they were both academics and undertook research that uh, was uh, relevant uh, to the real world, and I think they um, passed some of that uh, passion down to me. So on the left-hand side is uh, one of the papers uh, written by my father, who's a physicist, uh, latterly at the Br at University of Brunel, and this uh, paper is about semiconductor devices in transistors, uh, which are used to control the power of motors and in uh, dimming switches for lights. And I really hope there isn't anyone in the audience who can uh, uh, question me about that. <laughs> um, and uh, that was published in 1963. And this was published in 1966 uh, by my mother, who was latterly a professor at what's now the CAS Business School. And this is on uh, retail uh, distribution. And I just wanted to share with you uh, a sentence from the flap jacket of that book. Remember, this is published in 1966. The author, a specialist in the economics of distribution, writes from the point of view of both the economist and the housewife. <laughs> it's good to know that some things have changed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Naomi, for that uh, gold medal performance. Um, I think we have time for just a couple of questions before we move on to Martin's. Nigel. You... Thank you. Uh, thank you, Naomi. Marvellous lecture. Oh, sorry. Uh, Nigel Edwards. I'm a senior fellow at the King's Fund. Thank you, Naomi, for a, a marvel marvellous lecture. And, and uh, much of your research is familiar uh, to me. And, uh, but my main question was about dimmer switches, actually. Um, uh, <coughs> seriously. Um, the thing I've always liked about your research is the way that you, you pick up issues which are a real concern to uh, policymakers and, and people who run health systems. I wonder if you might just speculate on what's the, sort of the next set of things on the list uh, that you should be researching uh, uh, later. That would be helpful. Many things on the list, Nigel. Um, but I think, um, perhaps if I can pick out one, the um, sort of fallout, if you like, uh, from the Francis report and in particular how healthcare organisations are going to deal with the cultural challenge. And um, it's perhaps unfortunate uh, that the approach he's taken 
um, is around things like to have a duty of candour, uh, which I'm not sure you can actually have um, tell people they have to uh, be truthful. Um, so what I would be interested in is in um, helping boards um, uh, address that's the cultural challenge. So that's not just by using metrics, for example, though they are really, really important, but also more qualitative, softer measures of how they're understanding what's happening in their organisations and being able to tell when things are going wrong uh, much sooner than we have to date. Steve, do you want to... Steve Morris. Okay. Thank you very much. That was really interesting, Naomi. Thank you. Um, and particularly for someone like me who doesn't work directly in your field. Um, you talked a little bit about research methods, and you've, also, you've already talked about the future topics that you think of interest, but how do you see the methodology developing in your field as you're going forward? I guess to try and make sure it continues to be kind of useful, interesting from a policy point of view. Yes, I think there's a couple of things, at least a couple of things to say about that. The first is I think we need to get smarter about using data that already exist. Um, and it, it sort of relates to the second point. Um, but a side point of that is to be able to draw together quantitative and qualitative data much more effectively than we've been able to to date. Um, some, some of us have been able to do that, but it's often quite tricky. And I think um, we'll be able to be more impactful if, when we can draw those together. But also, we need to be able to um, conduct research in a much more timely fashion if we're really going to, be, to have an impact. So as I said, this world uh, moves very quickly and uh, managers have uh, short attention spans. Um, so we need to be able to um, uh, help them think through the, the challenges much more quickly than we've been able to to date. Thank you very much. Well, I think we probably need to move on, so, but uh, I'm sure Naomi would be very happy to talk to people about other questions uh, after the Thank lectures. You. Thank you.